This little video is supposed to help you to prepare the alternative assignment and understand external respiration, gas transport, and internal respiration, especially in aspects of what can change the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide they exchange in this area, and with it, the transport in the blood. So the external respiration is based on alveolar gas exchange. Here we look at the respiratory membrane which has to be crossed, being formed by the alveolar endothelium, diffuse basement membrane, and the capillary endothelium, which has to be crossed by oxygen from the alveolus to the capillaries, blood plasma, and uh, red blood cells, and then also for the carbon dioxide coming out of the blood into the alveolus. The exchange can vary due to, due to pressure gradient, as you can see, solubility, we addressed that a little bit before, but we'll summarize it again, Membrane thickness, referring to respiratory membrane, total surface area, ventilation, perfusion, coupling. So these factors can influence it. Partial pressure, as we can see, oxygen has a way, way steeper gradient than carbon dioxide, a difference on 60 millimeter mercury, more than 60 millimercury, where carbon dioxide barely has five. The blue graph, as you can see here, in, shows the normal gradient depending where within you are, how the pressure gradient changes fr from the atmosphere to the venous blood. The green graph shows a hyperbaric chamber, which like high oxygen, you can see how steep it gets. And then the red one, as you can see, has a slower oxygen diffusion rate because the gradient is smaller. So it takes longer for oxygen to cross the respiratory membrane. So the change in partial pressure can affect how much oxygen can we take into our blood flow. Solubility of the gases also plays a major role. Here, even though both gases are hydrophobic, carbon dioxide is more soluble than oxygen to a factor of almost 24. We addressed this in a previous slide a little bit earlier in class. That means even though carbon dioxide doesn't have as steep a gradient of oxygen, due to its higher solubility, if I would count the particles, the same number of particles could be exchanged due to that. Both of the particles of oxygen and carbon dioxide can also be influenced by the membrane thickness because as we know the diffusion is totally dependent on the path, meaning the time of diffusion I should say. The longer the diffusion takes, the less material can come from one area, i.e. the alveoli, to the blood for oxygen or the surveys for carbon dioxide. So diffusion will slow down dramatically with when the membrane gets thicker. One of the way it gets thicker, you can see here in pneumonia. Pneumonia, we have fluid in our lungs, so the alveolar walls get thickened by the edema, by the fluid built up. And this path, when it comes from like normally 0 0.5 micromolar, even if it's just one micromolar, which as you know, it's still very thin, 10 to the minus six, it doubles the time it takes for the oxygen to cross the membrane into the blood, and that's where the danger lays. Then even more important, or also important, is total surface of the membrane, which you can see here for emphysema. You can see the confluent alveoli. What it means is we're losing our tiny alveoli and get more bigger alveoli. By having larger alveoli sizes, that means our surface area is shrinking. I've shown this in class already with um, the jar full of marbles. Small marbles make a bigger surface in the same jar compared to big marbles in the same jar. Now ventilation perfusion coupling is regu regulating the airflow and blood flow and that's actually interconnected. And we want to look at this next. The autonomic nervous system can influence both, i.e. for airflow, as you can imagine, bronchodilation will increase the amount of air coming in, where um, bronchoconstriction will decrease the airflow coming in. The blood flow to the alveoli can also be changed by the amount of blood entering the capillary system. This can also be influenced by the autonomic nervous system and even also by local control. So let's look at this a little closer. Here we have bronchodilates when we have increased CO2 because we want to get rid of this CO2 out of the uh, lungs because, as you know, CO2 can affect our pH. So bronchodilation 
happens with increased partial carbon dioxide pressure. Decreased carbon dioxide pressure will allow less air to come in. The arterioles can also be dilated via the nervous system, allowing more blood to flow into the area, which is actually the opposite from all our systemic areas, because now we can actually with, when the arterioles dilate, we do this when we have more oxygen in it. In our capillaries and our tissue, as you remember maybe with pre-capillary sphincter regulation, they actually open up or we get a vasodilation if we have low oxygen. But just think about it, it's no use to bring blood to an area of the lung if there's no oxygen, when the whole reason is we are going to this area to get more oxygen being picked up from within the lung area. In summary, we will dilate the bronchioles to allow more CO2 to exit, and we will dilate the arterioles when we have more oxygen to pick up from the alveoli. Carbon dioxide exchange at the pulmonary capillaries. So how do we transport carbon dioxide. We reviewed this already a little bit in class and at that time I also told you that the majority of the carbon dioxide comes actually from bicarbonate which is moved into the erythrocytes and because it has a negative charge we need to get a negative particle out of the red blood cells and this is referred to as a chloride shift. Now by entering now the red blood cells we get an enzymatic reaction going where we convert hydrogen ion plus bicarbonate to carbonic acid to create CO2. This CO2 now can exit just by a few diffusion across the fused basement membrane and the two capillary levels into the alveolus. And that's how we breathe the CO2 out. And as you can see also, we have as a quick review for hemoglobin, which we'll talk in a minute about, we have hemoglobin by itself. We can call carb amino hemoglobin, which is some of the carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin, as already mentioned in class, and attached at the protein moiety at this time, protein portion of the molecule hemoglobin, not at the iron like oxygen. Oxyhemoglobin refers to that the oxygen is bound to the iron within the hemoglobin molecule. Deoxyhemoglobin, as you can see, can have also hydrogen ions attached. That's why it's referred to as HHB. And CAH stands for carb carbonic anhydrase. So oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve shows the oxygen loading. As you can see, I put a big arrow in at the alveoli. And that's close, close to 100%, meaning all our oxygen is loaded. And then we also have, as you can see also, other points like D and C. So somewhere like at normal level of altitude, the, um, the tissue might have a level of C or D or somewhere in between there would be our normal loading of oxygen in a normal condition. So just about, still about 90% can be loaded under these conditions in our tissue. I will review this again in the next movie. Sorry.